Welcome to the Yale Cyber Leadership Forum. There will be a Q&A session at the end. If you would like to submit a question for the panelists, please do so in the Q&A panel. This session is being recorded. We will begin shortly. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome virtually to Yale University's Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. I'm Ted Wittenstein, and this is session number three of the Yale Cyber Leadership Forum, Defending Forward, Implications for Safety, Security, and Sovereignty in Cyberspace. We'll introduce our terrific panelists in just a moment. As a reminder, all attendees have their volume and video muted, but we're eager to incorporate your questions you can submit those using the Q&A feature in Zoom. And as mentioned, we'll record the session and distribute and post the video afterwards for the benefit of everyone. For those of you tuning into the Cyber Leadership Forum for the first time, this is our third of seven bi-weekly Thursday webinars taking place this semester and focused on the theme of sovereignty in cyberspace and bridging the divide among the law, technology, policy, business, and academic communities on the most critical cybersecurity challenges of our time. Professor Ona Hathaway is our forum director and our partner since we first launched the forum in 2017, a widely recognized authority on transnational and national security law. She's the Gerard and Bernice Latrobe Smith Professor of International Law, director of Yale Law School's Center for Global Legal Challenges, a faculty member at the Jackson Institute, among many other senior leadership roles across the university. And we also have a great group of Jackson Institute and Yale Law School students who are part of the forum for class, interacting with the panelists and our practitioner fellows, and writing reaction papers based on the sessions. So we encourage you to follow along at cyber.forum.yale.edu. You can view the bios of the students and fellows, check out previous recordings, examine suggested readings, and check out our full-length agenda. So the fourth session will take place Two weeks from today at the same time, Thursday, March 18th, focused on election interference. We have Nathaniel Gleischer, head of cybersecurity policy at Facebook, and Ellen Nakashima, national security reporter for the Washington Post. So let's turn to today's special guests. We could spend the whole webinar reciting their incredible bios, so I'll just hit a few high points. Gary Korn is the director of the Technology Law and Security Program and an adjunct professor of cyber and national security law at the American University Washington College of Law. He retired from the US Army at the rank of Colonel, having served for 27 years on active duty in the Judge Advocate General's Corps. That extraordinary service culminated in five years as the staff judge advocate to US Cyber Command, where he was deeply involved in the full range of legal challenges impacting the evolution of US Cyber Command strategy organization and operations. And prior to that served as deputy legal counsel to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, among a number of other senior roles at the nexus between defense strategy, military operations and law. Suzanne Spaulding is senior advisor for Homeland Security and director of the Defending Democratic Institutions Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. She also serves as a member of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission Prior to joining CSIS, Ms. Spaulding served in the Obama administration as undersecretary at the Department of Homeland Security, leading the National Protection and Programs Directorate, which has since been transformed, as many of you know, into the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. And there she managed a $3 billion budget, a workforce of 18,000 employees charged with strengthening cybersecurity and protecting the nation's critical infrastructure. And her time at DHS followed stints in senior roles in the intelligence community and on the Hill. She's been an assistant general counsel of the CIA, general counsel of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, minority staff director of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, among other roles. So thank you so much, Gary and Suzanne, for being with us. Thank you, Ona, for putting all this great group together. I'll let Ona kick off the discussion and we'll help out with the Q&A once we turn to that. So remember, please, submit your questions using the Q&A function in Zoom, and we'll get to that later in the conversation. Thank you very much, and over to you, Ona. Great, thank you so much, Ted. Thanks uh, for um, all your hard work um, and for your great team that has made this all possible. Um, it's uh, great to have you both here with us. Um, I'm 
thrilled to get a chance to talk with you about our topics um, of today, Defend Forward. Um, and Gary, I wanted to start with you. Um, so as, as Ted mentioned, you spent time at US Cyber Command um, before leaving government. And in that role and many others that you um, held in government, you've seen the evolution of the Department of Defense strategy on cybersecurity really change over time. Um, I wonder if you could start off just by explaining for our students and, and listeners um, exactly what it is that US Cyber Command does um, and a bit of its history and your role within Cyber Command when you were there. Sure, uh, thanks, Ona, thanks, Ted. The opportunity to be here today. Um, I, I say quickly, you left off an incredibly important aspect of Suzanne's bio, and that is that she's a advisory board member to the Tech Law and Security Program. So you get a double whammy here today. So uh, thanks for that, Susan. Suzanne. Um, so Cyber Command, as an entity, was created in 2009. It was the merger of two other organizations that were developing and involving in DoD to kind of grapple with the emerging issues of cyber um, as the department grappled and the nation grappled with trying to understand what this problem set really is. Um, and as we still continue to grapple in a lot of ways, but um, you had a, an organization that was focused on internal defense of de DOD networks and you had an organization really nascent in, in capability and doctrine and thinking, but ostensibly focused on outward operations, um, you know, offensive or actions outside of DOD networks because of a series of different events um, and to include an episode called Buckshot Yankee, you know, where, where um, malware was found to have been introduced from pen drives uh, in Afghanistan, et cetera, that, that kind of galvanized attention and brought those together. That was the year before I got to Chairman's Legal um, and I started dipping my go into the water of working on some of these issues. Um, and then a few years later, I didn't, you know, my life wasn't driven toward getting to be a cyber lawyer. It just, that was the path where I ended up in the military. Um, and it was, a, you know, I'm glad it did. It was a great and fascinating thing to do. But so a few years later at Cyber Command, um, you know, already there was discussion about now taking this thing that was a sub-unified command under US Strategic Command and elevating it up in, in importance and stature within the DOD to be a full combatant command, which ultimately happened in 2018. So it's one of the, um, we're at 10 or maybe now 11 with space, but uh, uh, combatant commands with an overarching sort of global functional mission of cyber operations. That breaks down into three basic areas. Again, there's that piece of everything you do from your your network perimeter inward, internal defensive operations, securing your networks. Uh, it's, it's referred to as a secure operate and defend mission within DOD and, and Cyber Command has the lead for that. Um, a lot of connection and overlap with um, the side of NSA that performs similar functions more broadly for national security systems for the US government the largest national security system that, that exists is the DOD information network. And so that's sort of primarily for Cyber Command. On the out of network side of the house, um, you know, originally this was viewed as another war fighting capability, develop cyber tools and capabilities to integrate in with other war fighting capabilities you have to support the geographic combatant commands in the case of actual armed conflict or war. That, that still is part of the mission that exists. It's, it's important. Um, but there's also a kind of in the middle there, a defend the nation generally. Um, and it's, it's couched as defend against significant cyber attacks or incidents. Um, that is an area where the department, I think, has been drawn further into actual active operations. This is where we can have discussions about Defend Forward and what that all means. But a steady recognition over time that, that this threat space is not one that is only going to be triggered in a time of actual warfare. Our adversaries are acting constantly, um, assertively, aggressively at times, 
and, and there needs to be some activity to deal with that. Um, and, and that's sort of that mission space that the command has, has been picking up more and more, um, certainly in probably the last three or four years. And with the publication of the DOD cyber strategy in 2018 that, that incorporates some of these ideas. Great, so I do wanna come back to that, but first I wanna um, talk to um, Suzanne a bit about her experiences at DHS. So you spent a um, significant amount of time in your career um, in the intelligence community on the Hill, and then you served, as Ted mentioned, as the Undersecretary at the Department of Homeland Security during the Obama administration, leading the National Protection and Programs Directorate, which is now known as the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA. Um, can you say a bit about um, the role of DHS here and how its strategy and role in cybersecurity has changed a bit over time and maybe a bit how it um, connects to or syncs up with um, or is sometimes competitive with, to be honest, uh, DOD's uh, mission of, of addressing cybersecurity? Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Ona, and thank you, Ted, uh, and the organizers of this conference for inviting me to be a part of it today. And I'm really so pleased to particularly to be here with Gary, um, whose uh, you know, outstanding public service has continued in his leadership role at American University's Tech Law and Security Center and, and just you know, really continues to do great, great work. So Really looking forward to this time with you, Gary, as well as uh, as well as our, our hosts. Um, so you know, let's. So my involvement with cybersecurity sort of goes back to 1995 with the President's Critical Infrastructure Protection Panel and the Marsh Panel, Jack Marsh, uh, former Secretary of the Army, um, about both of which really zeroed in for the first time in a very uh, concerted way. Uh, and public way about the cybersecurity threats to our critical infrastructure. Um, and so when the Department of Homeland Security was stood up in 2002, uh, there was an office uh, called IAIP, Intelligence Analysis and Infrastructure Protection. They were combined into one. Uh, cyber was included as part of, you know, looking at infrastructure protection, part of that we understood needed to be cyber. Uh, a few years later, they split the Intel and the IP functions, I, uh, infrastructure protection functions, ultimately created over, you know, lots of reorgs over the years, uh, National Protection Programs Directorate, and cyber was sort of pulled out uh, as a growing recognition of the importance uh, of that cyber piece of that infrastructure protection mission. And um, when I arrived at DHS in 2011, uh, as the deputy undersecretary, there were two deputy uh, undersecretaries, one for cyber and one for everything else. Um, and the everything else included not just IP, but also uh, biometric identity uh, office and the Federal Protective Service and, uh, you know, a number of different things that kind of were, were thrown in and was viewed as kind of a grab bag of, of, you know, this is where we put things we don't know where else they fit. Um, kind of, and, and one of the things that I did when I came in and ultimately I became the undersecretary when my predecessor Rand Beers moved up was to say, we need to bring greater unity of effort around uh, this mission space. Um, because while it made sense to, to have a dedicated cadre of cyber specialists, cyber experts, I called them my cyber ninjas, bring their exquisite uh, talents to bear on this challenge. What unfortunately had happened over time, and Rand Beers, my predecessor, recognized this first, was that these stovepipes had built between the people who were worried about infrastructure, critical infrastructure uh, or from a physical perspective, whether natural disasters or sabotage, terrorism, what have you, and those who were worried about cybersecurity. And what we understood by, by 2011, what we understood is that these things were becoming uh, more at, the convergence between physical and cyber was becoming uh, more and more significant. Um, and so what has happened over since, since that time, we worked very hard on trying to break down those stovepipes and get those folks to recognize that they were engaged in the same mission, that this wasn't in fact a disparate you know, set of activities, but was really all about um, strengthening the security and the resilience of our nation's critical infrastructure across all hazards, and that you can't have these days strong physical security without 
focus on cybersecurity um, because so much of our physical security is networked now, right? And you can't have good cybersecurity without good physical security because if you can get physical access to critical uh, equipment in your in your cyber network, you you know you're in big trouble. And most importantly, to assess risk, to manage the risk from cyber, you have to look not just at threat and vulnerability, but on the impact, right, of that cyber incident. And the people who best understood those interdependencies, those cascading effects in the real world from a cyber event were the folks who'd been working for many, many years with critical infrastructure owners and operators on anticipating uh, impact from physical events. And so bringing those together became critically important. And that, that, has, that is an evolution that has, um, is not well understood. I think CEOs get it in the private sector, uh, but a lot of folks on the Hill don't get it. And, and a lot of folks across government don't fully yet appreciate why CISA needs, needed to be and is more than just a cybersecurity agency. It is cybersecurity and infrastructure security um, because you've got to bring those things together. Managing that risk means also mitigating the impact of a successful cyber attack, not just in your networks, but putting in paper ballots, putting in hand cranks, right? Analog solutions. Um, so that's, uh, you know, I would say sort of the evolution of the cyber strategy at DHS. Great. And I want to come back to kind of dig in on the critical infrastructure side, because that's something obviously really crucial to understanding kind of both vulnerability and how to defend against it. But first, let me come back to you, Gary. So you ended your answer uh, to the last question by referencing the 2018 DOD um, cyber strategy. And that um, was the first formal introduction of this strategic concept called Defend Forward, which is the title of our, of our um, talk today. Um, and that strategy, for those who aren't familiar with it, said that DOD will, quote, defend forward to disrupt or halt malicious cyber activity at its source, including activity that falls below the level of armed conflict. Um, and many um, think that this announced strategy marked an important shift in DOD's strategic posture to one that was more proactive. Um, and that was, uh, one might say, in a more negative sense, more aggressive. Um, so can you say a bit more about how you understand the idea of defend forward? Um, and was this really a significant shift in 2018? Um, what kind of impact, if, if it is a shift, what kind of impact does it had on the way in which the United States and particularly Cyber Command approaches the project of defending um, against cyber threats? I, I think it was significant. Um, and it was, it was a function of a, a different thinking strategically um, different policy frameworks to enable a different strategic mindset, congressional action to, um, you know, back that in, in certain ways and, and provide some authorities necessary, um, all with a view toward um, being more proactive in confronting the ongoing constant day-to-day -day cyber threats that we face. Uh, prior to that, um, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent, it, and there was an approach that was one that's been described more of restraint um, and with, with a hope that that would lead in some sense to um, diminishing activity in the environment through restraint and example. The experience was more the opposite. Um, it, it was just set signaling to adversaries that there's no real reason not to continue to engage. Um, so you, you see this um, shift conceptually to something that needs to be more proactive and engaging. You know, for me, um, I don't look at defend forward as directly a deterrence concept. Um, I look at it potentially as contributing to deterrence um, indirectly in the sense of, you know, benefit denial to an adversary uh, and, and beyond just hardening your systems and making it harder for the adversary to achieve success, you're now actually um, engaging forward to disrupt the adversary's ability to maneuver against you. Um, and that, that does contribute in the denial sense. Um, but overall, you know, it's very, in my mind, similar to 
some other areas that we, we have seen um, where deterrence itself is hard to achieve, right? Deterrence is generally the inchoate threat of consequence uh, that is, you know, omnipresent to, to change your adversary's decision calculus and make them think two, three, four times before taking an action that you don't want them to take. Um, we saw, for example, at, after September 11th, that you don't deter nihilist, you know, terrorist organizations. They're just not really amenable to being threatened to rethinking their, their approach. And so we, kind of, we shifted to a counter terror posture where we f realized we had to actually engage the adversary forward um, as part of a much broader construct, but certainly a significant part of it to disrupt the adversary's ability to plan, to bring resources together, to execute operations, to keep the adversary off balance and, and drive the tempo of the situation. Um, and I think there's this, another similar analogy. There's a reason why we have what we call counterintelligence, right? You're, you're not gonna effectively deter adversaries from engaging in, in espionage activities because it's too lucrative, it's too important and valuable to them. Um, and so you have to be better at it and you have to be disruptive to their efforts. There's a lot of similarity in my mind to what we're seeing in the cyber environment. Um, this may change over time um, as, as we tweak all sorts of aspects of this, but I'd say at the moment that the, the um, it, it's just too lucrative for our adversaries. It's, it's driving benefit for them at low risk and low cost. And so deterrence is gonna be hard to achieve. Not that we shouldn't be figuring it out and pursuing it um, you know, at the same time, but this is at its heart for me to fend forward is a counter cyber uh, uh, aspect to that broader approach. So your, your comparison to counterterrorism is, is quite interesting. Um, and it does raise the sort of overall theme of our conference of sovereignty um, or the series of sovereignty um, because both counterterrorism and this more um, sort of aggressive uh, uh, defend forward policy on cybersecurity means going out. You're not just staying within your own networks, you're moving out to engage the, um, the threat um, outside of your own networks um, and abroad. Um, and that means um, engaging in operations uh, on the territory of another state, maybe on another state's uh, computer networks. Um, and, um, and that has raised some questions of kind of how we think about this question of sovereignty in cyberspace. As you are quite familiar, the Talon Manual adopts this very aggressive idea or very strong idea of, of sovereignty um, on the internet and suggests that states that violate uh, sovereignty, that actors that violate sovereignty um, of other states uh, uh, through their cyber activities can be subject to countermeasures. Um, how does that mesh with the defend forward strategy, which seems at least on the face of it to, to be in some tension with this idea or at least make the United States vulnerable to, um, to countermeasures uh, if it's engaging in the kinds of activities that might interfere with the sovereignty of other states. Certainly counterterrorism activities have raised those kinds of concerns. We're dropping bombs on other countries. We have to issue Article 51 letters explaining why it's uh, you know, within our uh, legal rights under the UN Charter and some question whether that um, those, those statements are actually accurate. So how do we think about these concepts in cyberspace and, and does this defend forward strategy because it means engaging the enemy outside of our own networks create some concerns about what the United States is, is, is doing abroad and, and whether it's infringing on the sovereignty of, of other states in the process? Sure. Um, just an easy question, <laughs> right? Oh, no, I, in, in, the, in the CT environment, the counterterrorism environment, yes, similar issues have come up. They are more they're of a different nature to, in some sense. They're more acute because you are oftentimes talking about using kinetic force inside the territory of a third party state um, and squaring that with international law and our obligations. And we know there's some who will debate, not everyone agrees, but the unwilling, unable analysis of being consistent with 
um, the UN Charter and USAID bell and prohibitions on using force except in self-defense. Um, that, that, you know, defend forward doesn't necessarily specify the level of activity you're going to engage in. Um, I would call it more proactive. I wouldn't necessarily call it aggressive. I understand, you know, the, the, the description, but um, it, it can run a spectrum, right? And there's absolutely at the same time a commitment to adherence to international legal obligations. The, the question that has arisen um, sort of at the lower end of the spectrum of taking activities, you know, you might engage and disrupt a botnet. We had reports about a trick bot takedown um, and the run up to the elections. Uh, if you are just engaging with infrastructure in a third party territory um, to essentially deactivate or put to sleep um, malware that's running as part of a botnet, does that implicate an international legal obligation not to do that unless you have a justification or consent? That's a, a question of serious debate right now in the international community. We see states starting to, to come up uh, with statements that are kind of across the spectrum, I would say. There are some that are pretty hard on one side and the other, um, agreeing or disagreeing with the Talon Manual's approach. The Talon Manual laid out a view that that sovereignty is a standalone rule in the international order. Um, mm -hmm. Others don't necessarily agree. The UK Attorney General came out 2018, I think, with a, with a very different view, one that I've written about, one that I tend to share, um, that sovereignty is a organizing principle and concept in the international order, but you have to look to see where states have actually, based on protecting sovereignty, agreed to, to more firm rules. Article 2.4, the prohibition on the use of force is a classic example, and there's others we can talk about. Um, so a lot turns on this question. Are you, are you violating international law by that, that trick bot takedown? Not if you are of a view that it's at a level that doesn't implicate higher thresholds of actual rules. And I'd say you could probably square it as well with the views of the Talon group. Um, theirs wasn't an absolutist approach to sovereignty either. Um, you know, there's even within the rule, they couldn't agree to what the thresholds would be, but they agreed that there are some thresholds under which your operation still would not breach this, this uh, putative rule. Great. Um, so Suzanne, I want to turn to you and, and invite you to weigh in on this. Um, and in particular, how does, uh, how does Cyber Command's Defend Forward strategy mesh, mesh with DHS's um, strategy? Is there tension, and in particular, I could imagine a source of tension being, um, you know, DOD is, is engaging in more um, proactive um, activities outside of the United States in, in this defend forward means. Are we seeing kind of kickbacks from that? Are we seeing um, other states sort of similarly acting more aggressively towards us? Does it create increased vulnerabilities? We have a very big attack surface. Um, so, you know, is this seen as potentially creating vulnerabilities or is it seen instead as actually necessary to deterrence and therefore helpful to DHS's mission because, you know, it's clear there's going to be consequences if you engage in bad behavior because the cyber command is going to come after you. So how does this mesh with, with DHS's um, strategy and policies? Yeah, um, thank you. I, you know, I think uh, Gary's very thoughtful and, and informed comments. Um, highlight one of the challenges though that we have in this uh, conversation broadly, um, not just today, uh, and that is lexicon and definitions. Uh, we, we are really so hamstrung by um, not having a, a, a strong consensus around what all these terms mean. You know, what, what, what is in, embraced in defend forward and persistent engagement, what is active defense you know, is active defense just a code word for offensive activities or, or is it anything other than just sitting back and waiting to be attacked by the adversary and what in between it, you know, it's just, and what is deterrence, right? Um, I, I, I really appreciated Gary's, uh, you know, initial comments about, you know, the policy of restraint. Uh, I think that's often confused with or, or equated with deterrence and obviously a policy of restraint. He's absolutely correct. And, you know, hasn't worked. I, I don't know the degree to which it was an articulated policy, but, but a failure to raise the costs and, and deny benefits for our adversaries has not been very successful. Um, you know, I, but, but, I, but 
but my colleague at CSIS, Jim Lewis, an incredibly smart, thoughtful guy, uh, and others who talk about you know deterrence can't work, and then proceed to talk about how important it is to impose consequences and raise costs for our adversaries. Um, I, my my mind, that is deterrence. That's part of deterrence. So uh, so I do think we are we we sometimes are talking past each other, and that makes it hard. Um, but to get to your you know your question there, in terms of the sort of proactive persistent engagement going out and and having a, you know friction with our adversaries short of war right short of of a triggering that use of force um, given the challenge of knowing where that line is um, it is not in uh, inevitably inconsistent with DHS's mission and what DHS is trying to do it can create some tensions right? So both, you know, those Cybercom and NSA and, and others who are, who are out there actively, you know, um, knocking heads with our adversaries on a regular basis, uh, and DHS, who is doing some active defense kinds of things and working with the private sector, um, both understand that one of our greatest strengths as a democracy, and it applies to cyber as well, is our, our, our allies and our partnerships. Right? And so uh, whatever we do, we need to understand, we need to bring into bear the discussion about the risks that might pose to our allies and our partners and to those relationships. So regardless of where we think the law should be, and even regardless of where we think in our interpretation the law is on sovereignty, et cetera, what we really need to be taking into account as we're doing our planning today is where do our allies think those lines are? What is the impact this is going to have on those relationships that we know are fundamental? They are an asymmetric strength for us, right? None of our most important adversaries have the kinds of partnerships and allies that we do. So that's a real strength and we need to make sure we protect that. All of us, uh, you know, regardless of our mission space, we get that. And both sides also really value how important it is to defend our networks and to do so not in a proactive way, not just passively. So again, they're not inherently inconsistent, but having said that, it's really important that DHS be at the table when these decisions are being made and when these conversations are being had at the interagency at the White House about what are we going to do? Um, because there are equities at stake. Uh, particularly I found when I was at DHS, um, my role to bring the private sector equities to the table and to the conversation, because we know that the private sector often bears the brunt of retaliation, particularly from our adversaries, not, so, not necessarily so much from our allies, although they've gotten caught up in some of that as well, right? When we do things that, that reduce the trust of our allies and our partners um, in, 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 in uh, the US government, that has an impact on the ability of you know, the private sector also uh, to operate in that global environment. So those equities are really important to bring to bear the equities of the civilian government. Um, this, is the, this is the primary responsibility of DHS, that, that's you know, uh, um, point for the protecting of the non-governmental uh, folks and state, local, territorial, and tribal governments who also often bear the brunt, and then the civilian government. Um, so that's where this tension can come in. Great. And we are going to have a whole session devoted to diplomacy on cybersecurity. We've talked a little bit about sort of success of diplomacy on the um, criminal side, sort of addressing, sort of getting some baselines of agreement on um, what constitutes cybercrime. And we're going to talk more about sort of the fairly still nascent moves towards diplomacy to address the national security side, which has been fairly slow to develop, as, as you both no doubt know. Uh, but I wanted to turn to the critical infrastructure, because that is such an important part of this conversation. I wonder if you could just say a little bit about what is critical infrastructure, because, you know, we throw that term around, but it's not always entirely clear what we mean by it. And you alluded to this before, but um, I wonder if you could say a bit too about the fact that critical infrastructure, so much of it is privately owned and the challenges that that creates for the government in protecting or requiring protection of, or you know, what, what, how, does that, how does that create um, difficulties for the government when it comes to protecting what we 
referred to as critical infrastructure. Yeah, great. So, you know, critical infrastructure, fortunately, is one of those terms we actually do have a definition for. Um, you know, not enough people, I think, focus on the actual definition, and instead we get hung up on the, uh, the organizational construct that we created to try to get our arms around it. So we have these 17 now with election infrastructure sectors, um, but, but that's not critical infrastructure. Critical infrastructure is defined as systems, networks, uh, and assets, whether physical or cyber, the disruption of which would have a debilitating impact on national security, economic security, or public health and safety, or any combination thereof. Mm-hmm. So that's that's what 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 is critical, right? Those things that where you could really have a significant disruption uh, of of those uh, important national interests. And so what we are what we have been moving to in DHS is um, starting with uh, President Obama's Executive Order 13636, where he directed us in Section 9 of that order to create a list of entities where a a successful cyber attack would have catastrophic consequences for economic security, national security, or public health and safety, and uh, to sort of create a, a, a most important kind of list. And we did that, but it you know, it was a start to sort of get our head around what are the most important things. It, it had lots of flaws. Um, and now what DHS is doing is this national critical functions. So the National Risk Management Center at DHS is looking at what are the most critical functions? This is about functionality, right? What are the most important functions um, that Americans depend upon and that are, you know, uh, you know, most important for our national security, economic security and public health and safety? And in mapping those functions, right, then where are the key nodes? Where are the key places? And so that's really important work. It's very nascent. Um, it's very complicated. It's very difficult, but it's the direction we have to go in. And it's, again, based on the impact of a successful cyber attack. So moving us away from such an intensive focus on threat and vulnerability only to, to assessing risks based on what could really happen in the real world here. Um, so, so that's, and, and of course, to get those insights, we have to work very collaboratively with the private sector. And this was one of the things that we focused on in the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. We can't, we can't just talk about information sharing. This is not just about pushing bits of information back and forth across the table. It's about collaboration. It's about sharing insights and understanding and planning. So we, we, we called for, and Congress uh, enacted a uh, called for now in the Defense Authorization Act Joint Cyber Planning Office, where the private sector would be at the table for the planning and how we will respond to these things. That's great. Yeah, I mean, that's been a general theme that we've come across as well, sort of the challenges that you face because so much of where this is happening is on private, private infrastructure and that creates a special challenge for government operating in this space. So I want to turn, um, Gary, to a term that's come up a few times. Um, that is this idea of persistent engagement. Um, so we've seen this idea, you know, so we've, we've, we've discussed uh, Defend Forward. We've also sort of mentioned this idea of persistent engagement. We've, we've heard um, in particular from General Makasoni, who's the NSA Director and Commander of the US Cyber Command. He's a strong proponent of this idea. How, how do these concepts of Defend Forward and persistent engagement work together? Um, do they overlap? Are they just sort of different ways of saying the same thing? You know, what, what, is, what is this idea of, of persistently engaging our enemy? I will give you my take, um, an educated take, but also acknowledging that there have, there's not been necessarily consistent voice coming out of the department when talking about this, mm-hmm. um, which creates its own challenges. I, they're, they're not the same. They're not synonymous. Um, th- there is some overlap. Uh, if I had to distill it down, I would say, you know, the, the, the notion of persistent engagement appears in um, a, a 2018 document produced by the command as the commander's vision, right? This to me is, is laying down a commander's philosophy about how we are going to approach the problem overall, which is one of not reaction, not intermittent response, but proaction and consistent proaction. Um, and General Nakasone has been 
consistent in explaining this is not just about consistency or proact proactivity in conducting out of network operations. Defend forward is a piece of a larger, of a larger pie. It's also persistence and in innovation. It's persistence in developing the cyber um, operational force and the workforce. It's persistence uh, to Suzanne's earlier points in, in cultivating partnerships and developing them, right? It's a persistence across all of the, the different facets that go into a holistic um, bettering of our cybersecurity posture and our ability to address these risks and threats. So, you know, I, I look at it as a sort of commander's philosophy to drive the force in how it's operating and thinking about all these things. That is different than an operational concept embedded in a strategy um, of defending forward, which is certainly much more focused on out of um, network operations. These things, of course, morph, they evolve. Um, you know, it's, it's even the notion of the forces that we developed to do that internal network defense op, you know, operations are very different than the forces developed to do out of network operations. But in the roll up to the 2018 midterms, um, someone had the great idea that, wait a minute, we can take these internal defense teams and in partnership forward with certain countries under a framework that's, that's approved with consent, et cetera, uh, they can operate on networks forward, right? internal to those networks and develop tremendous insights, um, things that were then uh, collected in a very different framework than your normal uh, classified signals intelligence, et cetera, and more easily shareable with the private sector for, you know, in that regard. So um, you know, there's, there's value there, but very different sort of things that touch on each other, persistence and persistent engagement and defend forward. Um, I want to jump ahead um, to um, uh, talk a little bit about um, whether Defend Forward, you know, one critique that you sometimes hear about Defend Forward is that it places a lot of emphasis on, on offense, perhaps at the, at the cost of defense. Um, uh, you all, um, I'm sure, um, are very aware of this recent solar winds hack. Um, which opened up a secret back door to uh, somewhere around 18,000 infected networks um, um, and has been uh, decried as really one of the most sophisticated operations um, that we've uh, seen and, and not only led to infiltration of lots of private businesses, but also US government networks. Um, so do we need to be worried that this sort of persistent engagement and defend forward, all of this has been leading to Kind of a focus outward and not as much of a focus inward and, and on defense as we ought to? Um, is this in defending forward? Are we not doing enough defense of our own networks? Or is it just inevitable that all that we kind of need to be doing all of this and that solar winds is not necessarily um, an evidence that um, that sort of mistaken to be developing a kind of more persistent um, engagement um, effort abroad, but that, um, but that we also need to be doing a better job of, of you know, closing the back doors at home. Um, so how do we, how do we um, think about that? And is that a critique you think is fair or would you push back against it? I'd push back against it and I'd, I'd push back against it pretty hard. I, I'm not gonna say that there isn't tension at times, um, you know, just as there's the need to synchronize as best we can the DHS portion of this problem set with the DOD with the, the FBI and DOJ, et cetera, um, e even internal to DOD operations, there's always a question of analyzing intel gain loss, for example. If, if you're gonna conduct an operation, how does that impact your ability to continue to collect information that may be generating valuable insight? Um, if you're gonna tell me, if I put on a military hat and you're gonna tell me your mission is to defend you know, and protect this area uh, but you have no insight whatsoever about what the threat you have to protect it against. I I'm going to throw my hands up. I mean, I'll fill a lot of sandbags and I'll, I'll put soldiers around the perimeter to look out there, right? Um, you can't effectively defend and secure internally without the insights gained, certainly from the collection aspects of, of operating outside of your networks. So, you know, part of this is I think there's often again, back to the lack of clarity or consistency in terminology, 
There are people who will describe signals intelligence operations as offense, right? You're, you're pr prioritizing offense over defense. Uh, th that's, that's very different and it's wrong, but it's different than um, you know, network operations to be um, having disruptive effect forward outside of your networks. That all has to be synchronized, there's no doubt. Um, there are trade-offs no matter what you do. There are risks that are involved in inaction. There are risks involved in action. You wanna make sure you get everybody to the table to understand how these things will play out um, and so that you're planning for all the contingencies and weighing and balancing what's the right activity, you know, action at any given moment. Um, I, I just don't see that tension in the same way. And the other piece I'll say, certainly within the department, when I got to Cyber Command, the, the focus was massively on the internal securing and defending of the network. That hasn't stopped. That continues to be a major portion of the mission set. Um, as is true within, you know, I watched this from, from the side seats, but we were, obviously my boss was the director of the NSA as well. Um, the, the dual mission of the NSA of information assurance and, and, and network security um, and the signals intelligence mission. And those, those, there's a feedback loop there. You, you can't really separate one from the other. Um, everyone's always gonna kind of, I think, depending on where you sit, where priorities might look like they're falling at a given moment. Priorities equals resources. Resource equals the ability to do things. Um, there's there's going to be always some frustration there, but I don't see that that argument really holding a lot of water. So Suzanne, I want to turn to you on this on this question too, because um, of course DHS um, uh, is one of its central roles is this threat hunting, sometimes referred to as threat hunting. Um, and um, the recent um, NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, gave um, CISA uh, expanded threat hunting powers on US government networks. So gave it greater authority to be able to go looking for these kinds of problems. Um, and um, you know, how, wh what role is DHS playing here? Um, maybe you could say a bit more about what gap this was meant to fill in cyber defense. Um, and is it going to make it easier going forward to kind of deal with a problem like solar winds, which again is a problem that wasn't just directed exclusively at, compu at government computer networks. It was really, um, you know, extremely broad based and, and infected networks, both private um, and government. So what role is DHS, do you anticipate this is gonna open up for DHS to play um, in this kind of threat hunting um, area? Yeah. So. Um to be clear, the, the Defense Authorization Act authorized DHS to do this threat hunting in civilian federal uh, departments and agencies uh, and not in the private sector. So we're not authorized to go in and, you know, burrow our way into private sector uh, networks. Um, Important distinction. Yet. Yeah. No, I don't think, I don't <laughs> think that's, I don't think that's coming. Uh, um, certainly without the consent of uh, private sector companies and their lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but it's valuable to have this and important to have this authority, even just with respect to the departments and agencies. We know that, um, I, I guess it's nine, I think that Ann Neuberger said in her, that the um, uh, national, Deputy National Security Advisor for Cybersecurity uh, said in her press conference um, that, that we know we're impacted or at least um, uh, you know, potentially impacted by the solar winds uh, hack and what was, what's now being called, I guess, a sunburst um, hack. Uh, because more than just solar winds were, uh, we have more vectors than just solar winds. But the importance of this is when you do hear about something, I mean, we, we are still unfortunately primarily um, uh, reacting to, to finding, to detection, uh, you know, reacting to the discovery of something. Um, we are, we, and, but even in that context, uh, to be able to then, once we know what we're looking for, go broadly to other places where it has not yet been detected, right? And hunt through. So we can immediately load that into a, uh, what we call Einstein, a, a defense, uh, a perimeter defense uh, kind of technology and tool that we've provided to all the civilian government uh, agencies. And it can be blocked, it can be picked up and blocked, uh, you know, coming in after the, after the fact, now that we know it. But when something like this is in already, you need to be able to go in and hunt. You need to be able to go in and pour through, climb through, 
uh, the network. And even from one government agency to another, uh, working with this through with the lawyers took for, take, can take forever. So having clear authority from Congress to move quickly to figure out where it is, is really um, you know, quite, quite important and, and, and potentially will have a significant impact. Great, so before I turn to my final question, um, let me just uh, make sure that our audience knows that the Q&A is open. So if you have a question, please feel free to click on the box below, go ahead and put in your question because uh, we'll be turning to those in a moment. Uh, but Suzanne, I wanted to um, kind of uh, close this out by asking you a question about um, your role now at CSIS um, as Director of Defending Democratic Institutions. You've been thinking a lot about how to counter Russian and other efforts to undermine our democracy through disinformation. Um, I'm interested in, we're focused here on Defend Forward um, and the kind of way in which Cyber Command has been playing a significant role in countering cyber attacks um, and, and DHS has been addressing uh, threats to our critical infrastructure. But I wonder if you could say a bit about whether a similar kind of strategy should be extended to detecting and defending against disinformation campaigns um, or is that something that really uh, belongs in the private sector? Is there a role for government in this kind of active defense or defend forward um, against disinformation in the way that we uh, use that for threats to, the, to cybersecurity? Yeah, great. There's absolutely an important role for the federal government here. First of all, Gary alluded to one of the uh, kind of defend classic defend forward activities um, uh, that's been reported in the press around the 2018 election, uh, where, where media reports indicated that, um, you know, that, that we went after the Internet Research Agency and their networks um, and disrupted their ability in the run up to those midterm elections uh, to, to spew out their disinformation and to amplify and to use their network to, to uh, uh, distort our domestic political discourse. So that's you know, so one, one way in which it, it is relevant. I think of Defend Forward in another way in this context, and that is proactively leaning forward uh, to counter the impact. Again, I'm, you know, as you see, I'm big on, on looking at the impact. What is our adversary's objective? Our adversary's objective um, I don't think even they think necessarily I don't, that, that, that they're going to change the outcome of an election, um, but they certainly have a, a very good opportunity, and we've seen this, to undermine the public's trust in the legitimacy of that election, right? Um, they, they want uh, Americans to give up on democracy. They want Americans to believe that um, the system is irrevocably broken, right? And, uh, and that only violence and non-constitutional means can bring about change. And, and so we need to counter that pernicious messaging that gives, gets people to give up on the idea of truth or engagement, giving up at our informed and engaged citizenry. We need to counter the, we need to build public resilience against that pernicious messaging. And at the end of the day, that means reinvigorating civics education in this country. That means reminding Americans what democracy is about, that it must be fought for because it is under attack, that it is worth fighting for, not because it's perfect, far from it, but because it is capable of change, because it is susceptible to change, and teach Americans how to be more effective agents of change, how to hold our institutions accountable um, so that they can, again, uh, rediscover our shared values, uh, and, and stay engaged and that way counter our adversary's objective in a very proactive way. Great, that's a really powerful and important message. So thank you for that. Well, thank you both so much. I'm gonna hand it over to Ted who is going to um, be bringing uh, in all the great questions I can see we're already getting. So over to you, Ted. Uh, absolutely, thank you so much, uh, Ona, Suzanne, Gary. Great conversation and We'll try to get to as many of these as we can. Thankfully, we've already touched on a lot of them in this engaging back and forth uh, up until this point. Uh, Gary, just to bring you in on, on solar winds, we have a number of questions about it. Uh, this one is from one of our fellows, Paula Granger, you know, asking about, I think related to Suzanne's point earlier about the challenge of definitions. So at what point does something like solar winds become you know, a cyber attack as opposed to something that might look more like passive espionage. So 
you know, is there, is there a risk here that, you know, we're kind of defining or delegitimizing a type of activity that, you know, as part of a defend forward strategy, the United States may also wish to be, you know, engaged in in some form in terms of understanding, you know, adversarial networks. Is that something that, that worries you at all as you think about solar winds? And also, if it's just the scale of the attack that's worrisome, you know, how do, how do you think about things like, you know, Internet of Things, IoT, so many more devices that could potentially be brought into this? Yeah, I was on a, I was on a panel a few days ago with Paul Rosenzweig, and, and we took slightly different views on this um, and then talked afterwards and came to reconciled agreement. But, uh, you know, Paul's point with solar winds, I mean, it, let me back up and start. Most folks who look at this at the moment, based on the conglomeration of facts that we at least have in the public record, um, the indications that it was the SVR, which is a, you know, a Russian intelligence collection um, organization, not that they cannot, should we say, pitch the accesses that they've developed over to the GRU or others, they could. I mean, whenever you have access into a system, you can pivot pretty quickly um, to do effects operations or destructive things. But like all indications to this point are that this was a pretty broad effort at gaining access for the purpose of collecting information. As a matter of definition in international law, that's an espionage operation. And it's um, frustrating to people to hear, um, but you know, you kind of go back to E&I Clapper's comments and remarks with res in response to the OPM breach. Um, people in glass houses need to be careful, states engage in, in espionage. Having said that, that doesn't mean that we have to just sit back and accept it. There are, there's plenty of maneuver space to respond to it, to take action, you know, both to, to shore up the systems and prevent this from happening again, um, and to send messages to Russia that that this was of a sort of um, nature that was, as the president said, reckless in, in its execution, right? Um, you know, because the other thing too, I won't say that there isn't time, there aren't times when simply calling out an activity as violating a particular rule of international law doesn't have value in and of itself. But you, you got to step very cautiously before you start to call something, right, a, a use of force or an act of war. Um, you know, generally, my approach to, to dealing with commanders and policymakers is why are you asking the question? What do you intend to do? Right? I mean, if you're not willing to put, because let's, there isn't such a thing as a cyber war, that's a misnomer. If a cyber capability is used in a way that initiates war, you're in war, and and we know the consequences of warfare, right? So, um, you know, part of it is it just becomes a distracting conversation. I think um, there's some rich discussion about whether it violates other principles or rules of international law, um, but overall, what is what is the the response required and the framework and your your scope of of um, actions that you can take consistent with international law to deal with this problem set, we have maneuver space and we ought to be responding. Uh, thank you, uh, on, Gary. On the area of response, Suzanne, we have a few questions about sort of DHS incident response, you know, in the event of, of an emergency or in the aftermath of, of major intrusion like solar winds. Uh, this is one of our, our law students asking about whether you think DHS does have the authorities to, you know, investigate okay. private sector right. network in the aftermath of something like that happening. Um, you know, where is your sense of where we stand at incident response at the moment? You know, are there teams that would deploy or do you feel like these relationships exist with the private sector in, in a way that could allow stronger response go, going forward? 
Yeah, so again, we don't have any sort of blanket authority that allows us to go in uh, to private sector and get on private sector networks. We, we operate at DHS, um, and I continue to say we as if I was still there, but at DHS, they operate uh, very much on a voluntary basis with the private sector. And one of the things that we try to do is to, is particularly with respect to significant aspects of critical infrastructure, to, to have uh, understandings in place, to negotiate with their general counsels, uh, some understandings ahead of time uh, of what we would do should there be a significant incident, how far could we go and you know what, what would be off limits. Mostly what our folks would do if invited in is to stand next to somebody in the company who is on the keyboard and in their network um, and kind of over their shoulder, kind of help them uh, look to see what, you know, to do that kind of hunting, for example, um, and make recommendations for how to mitigate, how to get the adversary out, how to rebuild um, more securely for the next time. One of the things we learned in the wake of the OPM breach, um, where, where all of that information about uh, folks with clearances was stolen, um, attributed to the Chinese, was that we didn't have the authority to go into those uh, private sector companies that were, were under contract to do those background investigations. Um, so again, where we had, we had found, we knew that uh, you know, the adversary had gotten into one of those companies, but there were other companies doing similar work and we needed to get in there and figure out what was going on. Um, we have now uh, you know, gotten smarter, I think, in the federal government about contract terms that give authority contract by contract um, to if there's an incident, it needs to be reported. Uh, if we detect something and think there's an incident, you know, what are our authorities and, and ability to get in and figure out what's going on? We need to get better at that. And we need to, again, we need to have those understandings ideally in place ahead of time because time is really important when you're responding to an incident. Thank you for that. Uh, Gary, your comments about sort of parallels between Defend Forward and counterintelligence and counterterrorism uh, evoked a lot number of questions. One is from a, a YLS alum, uh, Jimmy Kite, asking about this question of, you know, can we establish norms that are below the armed attack threshold? So is there a risk here in being too clear about what sort of Below threshold of tax sort of vote response, or instead, are you seeing here a need to be more more clear as you think about where the command is now? Yeah, it's a great question. It's um, there's no single response necessarily. You know, on the one hand, I I'm a believer in international law. I'm a believer that we have an obligation to adhere to international law. Um, but I also don't necessarily see international law as the major deterrent force that others may argue, right? I don't, I was joking about this the other day with somebody, I don't anticipate, I can't say specifically, but that there are sort of Gary Kuhn counterparts in the military organizations conducting offensive cyber operations in Russia or, or China. Um, yeah, I'm not yeah, sure yeah, goes there. there. <laughs> but, you know, overall, you have to be careful not to be too specific, both from a um, anticipating what the environment will develop like right, when we make sort of definitive pronouncements about international law and with respect to technology and environment that's just evolving really rapidly, you, you have to be cautious and think your way through that, um, both to, you know, not speak with over breath or under inclusion and, and you know, become over restraining as well. Um, Having said all that, I do think that there's a reason why we haven't seen too many activities that are would, would clearly sort of cross that use of force threshold. There's edge, bait, edge case debating going on, but overall, I think our adversaries have calibrated their operations not to do that. I don't think they've done that because of some fealty to international law. I think they've done that because that um, it's a proxy for a red line. Right? They understand that 
if the United States wants to respond with force, they're going to have a greater argument, legitimacy behind that argument, um, because we can point to the standard international law. So it, it plays a role. And there, we have the rule of prohibited intervention underneath um, the use of force prohibition. So there, there is legal framework other than the use of force prohibition. And we now have the discussions in the GGE, et cetera, where you are developing um, a set of norms which are you know, peacetime, non-binding, um, but at least starting to set up, here's some parameters. Um, and yeah, I mean, you also have to, in setting your red lines and, and talking about how you're gonna conduct your defend forward and all these other things, ensure that you're not speaking out of you know, two sides of the equation um, and that you are acting consistent with the normative structure that you're trying to evolve and develop, especially with partners um, that, that share the same values that you do in approaching this problem set. Uh, thank you, Gary. I think we figured out the echo issue there, which is that all of us will mute ourselves when the other one isn't, isn't talking. Uh, but uh, maybe just to go to you, Suzanne, we have a few questions about defending forward or building resilience in other countries. You, you've spoken about, you know, working with partners and allies. I realize this is outside of how DHS may think about this in terms of inwardly looking with private sector uh, interface, but you've of course thought about this question in a much broader lens, given some of your other roles. You know, is there a role here for sort of building resilience with allies as, as well as you think about the norm question as well as the need for sort of broader cyber defense given all of our mutual vulnerabilities? Uh, without question. And um, again, this goes to the point that I made about our asymmetric source of strength, which is uh, these strong partnerships and alliances. Uh, I, there, we absolutely need to build that capacity to, to act jointly. And I would point uh, to the uh, takedown of the Imhotet uh, bot, uh, for example, as a you know a great example of um, you know that was the Netherlands had a very key role in that, uh, but so did so did our government and so did the private sector. I initially thought it was a wonderful example of public private coordination. Turns out maybe not quite as well coordinated as it might have been. I think, uh, but 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 points the way. Uh, both both were operating here, and I think um, and I think it's an indication of how we are learning uh, between the initial trickbot uh, net takedown uh, some months earlier and this one. We learned a lot about how to make it more lasting, uh, getting to the back offices and that kind of thing, and and the the back infrastructure. So I do think that's important, and and we did at DHS in terms of building re uh, resilience and capacity. Uh, our cert to cert relationships were some of the most important was some of the most important work that we did at DHS and cert is the computer emergency re readiness or response teams, um, the, the kind of operational team uh, at DHS and and we were have been very instrumental over years in helping to build similar teams all around the world. And they are the technical operational folks and they um, are developed have developed these strong relationships and understandings and uh, and so that's a really important uh, aspect for our national interest for defending our networks but also for the global ecosystem in which we operate hmm. uh, thank you so thank much you so for, for that, that. so, so um, we have five minutes remaining. We'll, we'll try to get to as many of these um, as we can. Uh, just going back to you, Gary, we have uh, one of our law students acting about, asking about the development of offensive cyber capabilities. And of course, you know, we can't always talk that publicly about this, but are you concerned that, you know, sort of prior restraint has led to the United States to potentially be behind in, in offensive abilities, you know, relative to adversaries or, and if so, you know, how do you think about sort of future investment in these tools while at the same time emphasizing defense and, and norm building at the same time? Uh, is there a tension there in, in your view? Um, I don't, I wouldn't, 
I'm not necessarily like the, the, the best person to ask if we are ahead or behind. And that takes a lot of insight into, you know, the adversary's capabilities, et cetera. I, I think um, I'm pretty comfortable from my experiences with um, the U.S.'s capabilities and advantage. There's a difference between the capabilities you have and the risk tolerance you have in employing those and the types of activities you're willing to engage in. Um, and we see our adversaries becoming, again, more having much greater risk tolerance, certainly more from, I'd say, Russia, China, a little bit different, although you know, we've got reports now coming out that they're taking cues from Russia and using India as a training ground um, and potentially having turned out the lights in Mumbai um, in dealing with the border skirmishes they've got going on. Um, I, I think that, you know, you always sort of, we say train to fight and fight to win, right? So even if you're not actively employing our, our military, we weren't just sitting around twiddling thumbs, we were developing all of the systems and capabilities from tanks to bombs to bullets that we figured we would have to employ in the, in the worst case scenario of having to go to warfare. There's similarity here. You continue to make the investments um, and, and develop these capabilities. They are certainly far more ephemeral than, than in the physical world. Um, you know, that which might be a valuable exploit today could disappear for you tomorrow, depending on the changes in the environment and security systems. So you have to be constantly doing that. I will say that um, we talk about reps and sets. Um, there, there is value. Uh, I wouldn't say you go out and do operations just so that you get better at them. But you shouldn't also ignore the fact that as we are engaging more, and I, I watched this, I watched this when um, the Secretary of Defense said, look, uh, we, have a, we have an ongoing fight with ISIS. We're going to bring cyber capabilities to bear. This is why we have Cyber Command. Um, and you had the creation of a joint task force. Operations were, were, were brought to bear, and they were a lot of them were very successful. Um, those are reps and sets that you're now learning from, improving your ability to, to, to maneuver in this space, improving your, your concepts and your tools that you can develop. Um, and I'd say the same is going to be true with Defend Forward as it becomes, instantiates, uh, and, and moves forward. Uh, thank you. Ed, yes, go ahead. I, I would just a quick add uh, to Gary's great answer for people who are really interested in this issue of are we ahead or behind. Belfer Center just came out with a very interesting paper on cyber power, uh, rank, using lots of empirical data to rank countries in terms of their, uh, if you think about military power, your, use, your ability to use military uh, power to, to advance your national interests. This is looking at the ability to use cyber to advance your national interests. And the United States, they put far and away uh, number one on that list. For what that's worth. I think they also bumped it up ex exponentially when I left government, is what I'm hearing. <laughs> <laughs> We're running out of time here. Uh, Suzanne, I might just throw one more question at you and before kicking it back uh, to, to Ona. One is about your role on, on the Cyber Solarium Commission um, and sort of how you think about what the optimal US government structure should be here. There is now a deputy national security advisor for cyber, possibly national cyber director. You know, are you worried about this sort of dual chain of command or, you know, who's in charge of sort of trying to coordinate the DHS and the DOD cyber command approaches or is, is this job so big that we do need multiple senior officials in your view? Yeah, so, uh, so I do think the National Cyber Director will be created. It was recommended by the commission and it was more importantly enacted by Congress in the Defense Authorization Bill in December. So, and I think the administration has made it clear they intend to abide by the law. They're, they are being thoughtful about how these various positions will relate to each other. Um, what we envisioned and what I think makes a lot of sense is that that Deputy National Security Advisor in the NSC, the Deputy National Security Advisor for Cyber, should coordinate what we call by shorthand Title 10, Title 50 activities, the military activities and the intelligence activities. That's a that's a as you can tell from this conversation today, a lot of activities and a big set of, of things that are happening. So just coordinating and and uh, those activities alone and making sure that the national security 
advisor has visibility, et cetera. But then also making sure that the national cyber director has visibility into those activities. The national cyber director will not direct military or intelligence activities. They will direct all the other cyber activities. Uh, but, but in doing so, we can't have a lack of visibility between the two. Each one has to be informed in, by transparency into what the other is doing. Um, and the role of the national cyber director should be, I think, first and foremost, to empower the departments and agencies to do their missions in cyber, and particularly with respect to the interagency missions they have. So DHS has an important across the government role in cybersecurity um, that requires a lot of you know, bringing the interagency together. The National Cybersecurity Director needs to sit next to the CISA director to make it clear the White House is, is backing them and people need to cooperate with this you know, department or agency. State Department is gonna have the lead on international activities. They don't do all the international activities. They have to coordinate across the government international activities. The NCD, the National Cyber Director needs to sit with that person to make it clear to the interagency the White House is serious about the State Department having visibility and the ability to coordinate and make sure that our international activities are consistent with our national strategy. So th that gives you a sense, I think, of kind of how, at least how I think, all of these things mesh together and make sense. Thank you, Thank Suzanne. You, Suzanne. Oh, no, 115 on the dot. So uh, over to you. I, uh, we answered as many as we could, more than are left. So we'll call that a success. Yes. Um, well, I want to just say thank you so much to both Gary and Suzanne for a, just a really enlightening conversation. Um, we managed to cover a lot in a relatively short period of time. We're super grateful for that. Um, for those whose questions we didn't get to, we're sorry, but we hope uh, that you will come back. We have four more sessions to go. And uh, the next one, as Ted mentioned, is in two weeks. We're going to be talking about left election security. Um, and so uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to dig in further into some of these issues. But thank you so much to Gary and Suzanne. Uh, thank you to all of our participants. Thanks, Ted. And we'll hopefully see you all back here in two weeks. So take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks.